Top of the heap brain researcher, Dr. Max Sinatter, who studies the workings of the human brain and its many mysteries, takes us along some interesting neural pathways today. He has the latest science on what makes a brain synapse, reshape, and rebuild. If you have never understood neuroplasticity, cortical remapping, concussions, or other traumatic brain occurrences, Dr. Sinatter can talk at length on the inner workings of the human brain. Stay with us for a fascinating Inside the Skull discussion. It is my pleasure to be here with you today and with my brainiac friend, Dr. Max Sinatter. He is an award-winning brain researcher who holds the Canada Research Chair in Brain Development at UBC. He is the director of the Brain Research Center at the university. Dr. Sinatter received his PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and it is our good fortune. <laughs> In, in 1998, I think, he brought his academic prowess to UBC. Brain health is his ongoing mission and his passion. Well, it's great to be here, Fanny. Along with playing a little tennis. Along with playing a little tennis, absolutely. When you were a, a young student, did you consider brain research or becoming a neurosurgeon? Well, actually, uh, what I did as an undergraduate was to play bridge. Uh, instead of going to university. <laughs> Good for the brain. <laughs> so I was, I was at McGill as an undergraduate and I was on the McGill bridge team and I basically spent most of my second, third and fourth years in uh, university playing cards. I got to be pretty good at it. I, I bet you did. I was on the uh, you know, intercollegiate team, and I'm a national master or something like this. And when I went to MIT in graduate school, uh, to graduate mm -hmm. school, I made a conscious decision to completely cold turkey. Okay, no I, more bridge. I said, I can either do bridge or uh, do mm -hmm. science, and I decided I'd rather do science. How do you think playing bridge helped your brain change well i think it's form. actually it's it's actually a tremendously absorbing and challenging thing to do it's very mm. sophisticated um, i would routinely play 4 hours of cards from you know 8 to midnight and then stay up till 3 in the morning discussing the hands with my equally rabid group of uh, friends and what was interesting is at that point i could remember every card in every hand that had been played all evening and I could still remember them the next week I could say remember that hand where you did this now so I think it teaches you memory it teaches you planning it teaches you even deception it uh, uh, you know sk skills like bridge uh, mm -hmm. chess uh, uh, poker uh, poker they're good for your brain I, and reading other people uh, I, I read a book a while ago I'm sure you did too Oliver Sacks yes uh, who could not uh, it was about somebody who could not recognize himself in the mirror. No, absolutely. Looks, looks at, at himself in the mirror, does not know who it is. Yeah. Well, the thing, you know, one of the things we're really learning is, of, you know, of course the brain is an integrated whole, and we are integrated mm -hmm. wholes as well. And yet there, you know, as we start to study it and as we look at what goes south in various conditions, we discover the categories you know, the ways in which you can fail. And some people just, there's a very specific area in the brain, it's sort of under here on the uh, uh, right side of your brain that seems to be involved in faces. And that's not far from another area that's involved with places. And there's another mm. area for body parts, actually. So if you've got some sort of a deficit in the face area, you're going to have a problem in face recognition. Well, there are mothers who can't recognize their own babies. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's it's, a little spot in the brain that doesn't work, or it's what? A little, it's a little spot in the brain that either doesn't work or doesn't uh, connect up properly with the other parts of the brain. The way, like, I don't really think of the brain as just a series of centers. I think of it as a series of, as a network with hubs in it. And there's mm. this one hub area that seems to be involved in face perception. and. If you lose that, for instance, you know, if it gets shot off in a war or if you have a stroke, uh, you can get quite a selective uh, deficit. You, we can also see it now because we can look into the brain, we can put people into scanners, and we can say, okay, I want you to look at these 
you know, 50 faces and tell me which ones you've seen before, or which ones are your friends. Uh, and we can see what parts of the brain are lighting up. And that enables us to identify these areas and also to identify the circuits that they're part of. How long have scientists believed that the brain is not static? That indeed it is plastic or has plasticity? It can shape it, it itself. Can, it can change. Well, it can I think, change. So I'll be honest with you. I always knew that. <laughs> okay, good. That's because you played all that bridge. I played all that bridge. But you see, I think actually the brain always changes. You know, if you remember this conversation mm. tomorrow, and I hope you will, uh, it will be because your brain changed as a result of what happened to it. And that's really what brain plasticity is. Brain plasticity is the process by which the brain changes depending on how it's used. So I think we've always known that, you know, given that, that we have memory, I've always believed memory can't happen. It doesn't happen in your liver, I'll put it that way. It right. happens in your brain. Mm -hmm. It happens because your brain changes uh, based on what happened to you. That's why you actually remember things. And um, we've known that a long time. What we're now understanding is how those changes take place what parts of the brain are involved. Um, we're learning that some parts of your brain are more flexible than others, more plastic than others. Some parts of your brain are pretty much implastic, for instance. They don't really change much, like your retina. So you, uh, you know, there's a piece of your brain called the retina. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's, it's brain just as surely as this part back here. It just happens to migrate out as when you're an embryo and attach itself to the back of the eye. And it's how you see. You can cover up both eyes or, you know, put somebody in the dark and the retina will grow up normally, will work and will function. Fascinating. I talked to Barbara Aerosmith Young who wrote The Woman Who Changed Her Brain and she yes. grew up uh, with severe learning disorders, mm -hmm. uh, could not uh, read or write, mm -hmm. uh, could not read an analog clock, but she could listen to the radio yeah. and, and remember every word on the newscast. Fascinating. What was going on there? Yeah. Any idea? Well, I think it's, it's really interesting, you know, when you look at people with these kinds of learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, um, you, you see these kinds of things in people with some learning disabilities. You also see them sometimes in people with autism, where they, they're missing a lot of skills or some skills that most of us have. And somehow, as a result of this, or perhaps uh, to compensate, they become extremely good at one thing. So mm. she could listen to the radio and she could uh, listen, you know, and she could remember everything. The way I like to think about it, and I could be wrong because there's no real proof of this, is mm -hmm. that, you know, your brain, your cortex is, you've seen pictures of it, it's this sort of crinkled up mass. It's actually a sheet, you know, uh, it's two millimeters thick. And it's about the size of a small coffee table, if I could un- If you ironed it. Yeah, if I ironed it, exactly, if I stretched it all out, okay? And on this sheet, different functions are laid out. Like one area is the face area, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know? You can think about it as another area is, you know, for vision and for hearing and for touch and for smell and all these different areas. Now, what may be going wrong in some of these learning disabilities is it's like a real estate issue. You know, you'd normally have some space for retail and some mm -hmm. space for this and some space for that. In the brain, if you've got something that goes wrong, so now you've got a learning disability, you can't, you know, do certain mm -hmm. things. So you've got all that vacant real estate. Nature abhors a vacuum. And what we think may be going on in some of these people is that some functions just expand to fill up that empty real estate. So uh, I know of someone with autism who has, a, he has the map of the New York subway system in his head. You, you know, he can tell you how to get from any stop to any stop and he can't hold down a job and he can't, mm -hmm. uh, you know, do lots of other things. What I think is going on in his head is that the parts of the brain that were involved in normal processing have been taken over by this one function, which in the case of Barbara Arrowsmith is being able to remember everything she learned. So 
instead of uh, you know, there being a, a, a normal allocation of functions, one function takes over, just grabs all that real estate. Because that's what's mm. going on when you're, uh, you know, when you're trying to sort of set the boundaries of your capabilities. Right. Um, you've got you know, a part here for vision, a part here for hearing, a part here for faces, a part here for this. But let's say that process by which this real estate is allocated mm -hmm. goes awry, then suddenly the New York subway map takes over everything. Okay, and as you know, we all have a little bit of something. We do. Uh, some people remember numbers, some people remember uh, words, some people yep. have a keen sense of smell. Absolutely. Some people don't. Yeah. All in the brain. All in the brain. And actually, you know, we're, we're learning more and more about how these functions work. We're learning how uh, they're located in the brain. We're, le we're learning about the circuits that they're part of. And, you know, what's happening now is, uh, so our, our center, you know, we're in the middle of this amazing revolution in genetics mm -hmm. and imaging and mm -hmm. everything. And one of the things our center is doing now at uh, UBC is we are developing what's called a synapse chip. So it turns out that you've got 20,000 human genes all together, and there are about 800 of them, so about 5%, that are used really to run the synapses that connect brain cells to each other. We can now sequence, we can now sequence all those genes at once for 200 bucks in you. Really? Give me a little of your spit or blood, okay. and, and, and I will tell you how you differ from the average synapse gene person. Fascinating. And what we think is we're going to be able to learn from this is just those kinds of things. Why it is that one person has a good sense of direction and another doesn't. Why it is that somebody has a good mathematical or musical sense and another doesn't. What distinguishes our, why is one person you know, good at thinking on their feet and another not? Those kinds of things I think are going to be determined at least in part by the genetic variants that you were born with and then again changed encore by what happens to you <laughs> during your life. But understanding those genetic variants, which we think we can do with one chip, uh, is going to be, I think, incredibly powerful. First, it's going to teach us, you know, what kinds, how you get those kinds of learning mm -hmm. disabilities where somebody has no sense of direction at all, mm -hmm. spin them around and they have no idea right. where they are. And there are, there are those people. Uh, and yet there are other people. I've, uh, I was told the story of, uh, of an individual who, you know, uh, he was dead asleep in a car in the middle of a country road in France and they're sitting there arguing uh, about how to get to Paris. And he, you know, he woke up and he said, there. And of course he was dead right. So oh, there are I people, want to be with him next well, there, time I'm in France. Exactly. There are people at both ends, ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So we think we're going to understand, it's, of course it's in the brain, right. but we think we're going to understand where in the brain, how in the brain, and ultimately I hope we're going to be able to manipulate it so yes. that we can, uh, if there's a gene variation that uh, leads you to have a great sense of direction, then maybe, and, maybe we can and I urge know it that is on not you. linked to intelligence. There are people who can't. Uh, Einstein yeah, or somebody no, who couldn't absolutely. find his way absolutely. wasn't about his intelligence. Yeah. No, it can be it it can be associated with what we call mental retardation. These mm. capabilities can be independent of each other. And I think this is what Barbara Arrowsmith uh, uh, demonstrated in her uh, you know in her learning disability. You right. can get people who are very very smart who have profound inabilities to, I don't know, to read or to do what's called dyscalculia, even do simple math, which mm. is like dyslexia, but for mm -hmm. numbers. Or you can be the opposite. And you can have profound deficits everywhere, but some things are just off the charts. When we come back, let's talk about a da the damaged brain, the concussed okay. brain, okay. and the link. There's a study, as you know, and you've been involved, uh, yeah. between concussion and suicide. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Dr. Max Sinatter, our guest, he's the director of the Brain Research Center at UBC.